Good morning. morning. It's so exciting to have the Saturday and Sunday church together. And I'm really pleased to be bringing God's word today as we again look at our series about transition. And we consider the lives of different people from the Bible, characters in the Bible that have undergone difficult times of change and what we can learn from them. But before I do so, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and we know that your word is relevant to us today. It's living and active, Lord, that when we allow it, when we listen to you, you can really touch our hearts, you can cut through everything that's going on in our minds, in our lives. And so we just ask, Lord, that your presence, just as you're with us in the worship, that you'll also be with us in the quietness as we consider what you have to say to us this morning. Be with me as I bring your word, Lord. May it be edifying and lifting you up to your glory. Amen. When things are going smoothly and we feel things are in control, when the relationships we have are good and people treat us kindly, when we have few problems and it's going smooth, we can be tempted to think, I've got this, I'm doing okay. But the reality is that these times are actually far few between because life happens, relationships happen, and life is constantly changing. And we're under pressure. And when we're under pressure, there is a temptation to respond to those pressures in a way that doesn't honor God. And so this morning, we're going to consider the disciples. Now, the disciples were under a lot of pressure. They experienced such change. In fact, they, most of them were fishermen, humble fishermen whose routine would have been to fish, to mend their nets. It would have been a very, um, they would know what was going to happen each day. And suddenly, they met this incredible man, Jesus. And he called them to leave their nets and follow him. In fact, I read from Matthew 4, 19 to 20. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. I think this is incredible. Do you ever think about that? These disciples listened, obeyed Jesus' call on their lives, and they left it all to follow him. Now, over the next three years, he really turned on their heads everything that they'd ever known, their worldview, the way that they had seen life and the world. He just broke in and changed it completely around. And he was so different from the religious leaders of that time, whom he called hypocrites and blind guides because they looked great on the outside, they looked quite holy, but inside they were far from God. And you could tell that by how they acted and what they said. And in contrast, Jesus' very words and his actions spoke life. He brought good news to the poor. He broke down chains and bondages. He brought healing. And he lived in such a way that just transformed lives, transforms ways of thinking. Now, this morning, I don't want to look at what the disciples did right, although they did a lot right, particularly when you consider um, they were part of founding the early church. But this morning, we're going to look at a couple of occasions when they um, responded badly because the temptations they had are the same ones that we have today, whether it's in our family life or in our work, in relationships, and also as we transition from City Hill and City um, Gateway to become one new church in Christ. And so we want to learn from them as we make that transition. I'm going to be looking particularly at the temptation for impulsiveness, acting, speaking without thinking, overprotectiveness, and competitiveness. And so we're going to start off in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, and we see here a really important event. Jesus speaks to his disciples and he says to them, who are people saying that I am? What's the word out there? Who do people think I am? 
And so reading from 14 to 17, they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he said, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. I imagine this was a real high point for Peter. He had been used by God to bring a revelation of who Jesus was, the Messiah. And Jesus carries on then to explain that on the truth that he is the Messiah, the Son of God, he would build his church. And he goes on to explain a bit of the role that Peter and the disciples are going to have in that building. Now, we know what Jesus was talking about building his church because we're part of that church. But for them then, their understanding of the Messiah was very different. They had been taught that the Messiah was going to be a powerful leader that was going to come in and restore Israel to its national glory, get rid of the oppression that they had long been under. But Jesus is about to tell them otherwise. They're going to have to renew their thinking because this was not going to be what they were expecting. And so picking up in verse 21, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to the disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. I don't know why Peter thought he could speak this way, perhaps because he had just, in a sense, been the mouthpiece of God, bringing that revelation that he feels he can step in now and rebuke Jesus. But Jesus, very quickly, is clear that Peter had in his mind man's concerns, Peter's concerns, not God's. And in fact, he now says he's been the mouthpiece of Satan. What a contrast to what had just been happening. And this would have been hard for him to to hear. We see here that Peter fell into two two temptations. The first one is that he speaks without thinking. He's impulsive. He's reactionary. And the second one is that he's overprotective of Jesus, stepping in, thinking it's his job to shield him. Another example when Peter did exactly the same thing, responding in those two ways, is found in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus is arrested. It says in John 18, 10 and 11, then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink from the cup the Father's given me? I want to consider the two temptations in turn. First of all, being impulsive and speaking and acting without thought. Proverbs 19 verse 2 says, enthusiasm without knowledge is no good. Haste makes mistakes. Through the Gospels, we see that Peter was was, um, quick to speak. He had enthusiasm. He was also really quite good with taking initiative, but the problem came that he would often speak without thinking and he was quick to get angry. Now, I don't know if there's anyone here that can relate to those attributes, being impulsive, speaking quickly. I know for myself, particularly when I was younger, I was very very quick to judge a situation and decide what was right. And then I would just speak it. And I considered myself to be speaking truth, to being honest. And my mother tells me that I was always like that. Even, she talks of when, as a girl, my grandmother gave us some scones. And um, she then asked a week later, did you enjoy the scones I made you? And I must tell you, they were like rock cakes. (laughs) They were nothing like Julie makes. And my mother, of course, said they were lovely. We we loved them. And I immediately stepped in and said, no, we didn't. You gave them to the birds. (laughs) And that was me. Even as I grew up, I was quick to be honest. And it took time, and I believe God's work, to show me that just because I considered something to be true didn't make it true. And it certainly didn't make it kind. 
and I needed to learn how to consider people and the complexities of life situations because I did see things quite black and quite white. I don't know if you can relate to that. I always remember a friend that said to me that truth without love is brutality. Love without truth is sentimentality. Colossians 4 verse 6 says, let your conversations be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. With Jesus, people knew that he cared. They knew that he loved them. Even when he spoke difficult things to them, he spoke with such compassion, such grace, that he was able to say it. And he wasn't quick to judge. In fact, he had every reason to be the judge, but he wasn't quick, he withheld judgment. We see that in many occasions, like with the woman who was caught in adultery, and the Pharisees were wanting her to be stoned. Also, we know that the leaders accused Jesus of eating with sinners and outcasts. Jesus withheld judgment. John 1.14, talking of him, says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. Now, in this time of transition, as we're going from one church to become joined together as one new church, City Gates, we need to be asking God for grace. We're gonna need grace for ourselves because there's gonna be times where we respond badly or we make mistakes, but we're going to need grace for one another. It really is important that we don't respond quickly and make judgments without thinking. We need to be careful with that and to presume the best. I believe that presuming the best of one another protects each other, but it also protects us, and it brings and fosters unity within the body. And in case you don't know what I mean by presuming the best, because it's always been a catchphrase for me, presume the best. I'll give you a practical example. If I was to come to church next week and greet you, and you ignored me, or, or perhaps said something that I might have thought, well, that, that seemed rude. I have a choice, I have a temptation. I can think and make a judgment. I can even respond badly, or I can pause and choose to presume the best. Choose to presume that maybe you didn't hear me, or that maybe you had a lot on your mind, or perhaps you're going through a hard time at the moment. Presuming the best protects yourself from taking slights, taking offense, but it protects the people. It gives everyone the benefit of the doubt. Leaves us time to, to allow God to be at working in our hearts, in our thoughts, in our words. Perhaps he wants us to, maybe that's an opportunity to realize there's something going on that we need to draw along and show God's love in, in, the, coming, in the coming week. So presume the best of each other. Show grace to each other. James 1 has something really helpful to say on this subject. Now, when James is talking in the context of this chapter, he's actually talking about God's word and how even when we hear God's word, we don't always like what God has to say. Hearers can be going, oh, I don't like that bit of the Bible. So he's talking about that context. But it's really relevant in every context because people will always be saying things that we don't like or don't agree with or don't feel comfortable with. And so we need to be, in fact, let me not put words into James's mouth. Let me read what James says in chapter 1, 19 to 20. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. I love how James starts with being quick to listen because we don't think of listening as an action, but actually listening is an action, it's a skill, a skill that we probably all need to develop because actively listening is not just listening with half an ear, ready to step in with our, what we want to contribute or with our opinion. Listening actively is hearing not just the words, but what the person is trying to say. And it says, quick, 
to listen, slow to respond. We need to slow down and slow to become angry because God doesn't achieve anything through our anger in this, in this context. And so we really can learn from what James says here. Ephesians 4.29 says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only for what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. I find it interesting that this bit of wisdom from Ephesians is talking about how our words are supposed to be for others' benefit, others' growth, lifting up, not to get things off our chest, not to get it out there, as I would always do, but we are called to be a family who is gracious, that looks to have words that uplift and edify, that bring healing, that calm situations, um, that express God's love for each other through them. We need to be quick to discard slights and to presume the best. The second thing that we learned from Peter's response was about being overprotective of Jesus. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Peter wasn't having any of this. His leader was not going to die on his watch. It seems noble, doesn't it? In, in worldly wisdom, wouldn't that be what we should do? If we have a boss that's going to be making a, a bad decision that's going to impact him, you know, our job would be to protect him from himself. But this is the kingdom of God, and it turns worldly wisdom on its head. Peter was not thinking in terms of God's concerns, but of man's concerns. In fact, it wasn't just man's concerns, it was Peter's concerns, because if we're honest, Peter had given up everything to follow Jesus. If Jesus then died, where would it leave him? Where would it leave the disciples? You can imagine him going, no, <laughs> that's not going to happen. That's not what I've got in mind. Not, that's not why we left our fishing to follow you. This protection was misplaced because God was the one that protects. He was stepping in into God's role. Jesus said on the night he was arrested, put away your sword. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? This was Jesus's purpose. This was God's will, God's plan. The cross was what was coming. And Peter stepping in to try to protect him was getting in the way of God's will and God's plan. And in fact, he was taking upon himself responsibility that wasn't, it wasn't his it was God's, um, it's God's role to be looking after Jesus. I think that we can learn from this because it's very easy to see things in terms of what we think makes sense and the way we think that things should go. And we do need a reminder that God is less interested in our comfort and far more interest in our growth and maturity. God's less interested in things going just the way we plan than he is of the gospel advancing and people hearing the good news. And so we need to remember, as it says in Isaiah 55, verse 8, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, said the Lord. Your ways are not my ways. And entrust God with what's going to come. Jesus didn't need Peter to protect him. Jesus didn't even try protecting himself but trusted God. We read in 1 Peter 2.23, when they hurled insults at him, he didn't retaliate. After he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted him to him who judges justly. On the back or immediately after this conversation with Peter and rebuking of Peter, Jesus goes on to say these words in verse 24 to 25. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. We, like his disciples, need to understand that we need to take our eyes off self, put aside pride, put aside our way, and allow God, allow Jesus to be our example and to follow him. Jesus, who gave up his position, fully God, 
became a baby, became a man, lived a life of love, sacrifice, so that we could be saved. Now, I've got two applications from this, and the first one is that as we go into this time of transition, becoming one new church in Christ, we need to be careful not to be overprotective of our leaders. There's going to be a temptation for us to go, oh, I don't think Fousey is getting the respect that he's due. Do, do people know who this man is? There's going to be temptation maybe to go, I don't think our elders are getting enough profile here. Or maybe we're part of teams and we're thinking, the City Hill ministry or team leaders, they're the ones that should be leading these new combined teams. You think it could be a temptation, couldn't it? Particularly when we don't know everyone that we're coming together with. We don't have an experience, a relationship at this point with them. But I want to say this morning, actually, we need to take care. Take a moment, because doing that won't necessarily be helpful. Jesus is building this church. Jesus is building city gates. He's placing people, leaders in positions. And to be honest, we don't all know all what's going on in the background. And so we need to entrust Jesus and trust the church and not be overprotective when they don't need it. In fact, um, it's really important principle that we do support leadership, of course. We do need to. And we need to go forward supporting our elders and our leaders here at City Hill, the leaders that we're working with. But we need to know that soon there's going to be a wider leadership team and we need to support them too. And we need to trust them and we need to entrust them to the Father who's building and it's his role to protect. In fact, if we look at Jesus' model with building up leaders, we see that Jesus with his disciples, he trained them, he supported them, but he didn't overprotect them. He often would send them out on their own into villages to, to take the good news, knowing they might suffer rejection and difficulties. But he did it knowing that this was needed, that they would grow and mature and that the gospel message would go out. He didn't step in every time something was going to be difficult, but trusted them and entrusted them to his father. Secondly, Jesus makes it clear to his disciples that not only it wasn't their role to protect him from the cross, but that they needed to understand that no servant is above his master and that they too were going to need to, to have that mind switch that, that for them too, they were going to have to follow in his example. There was going to be suffering for them as well. And we need to have that mindset too. Because God tells us, we too are disciples that need to deny self, to carry our cross, and to follow Jesus. And that is a narrow road. It's not the wide road, it's a narrow road. And it, we need to count the cost and be ready to follow where he goes. My final example this morning of temptation, I'm going to read from Mark 10, 35 to 40. It's about competitiveness. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do this for us, whatever we ask. What do you want me to do, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit on your right and the other on your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with but to sit at my right and my left is not for me to give. These places belong to those for whom they're being prepared. I don't know about you, but when I read this account, I'm like annoyed, really, that they could, in arrogance, say that they wanted to be at Jesus's right and left. It's like, why would you even think that? And Jesus hits the nail on the head when he says, you don't know what you're asking here. And, um, but then when I think about it, I know for myself how easy it is to get into the worldly thinking, particularly in this area, because all the messages around us are about success, about being the best you can be, about succeeding in your goals, self-actualization, self-realization, all those selves. And we compete in sport, 
we compete in games, we compete in the classroom, in the workplace. This spills over into relationships where very often we're looking for affirmation. We're looking for people to say, yes, you've cracked it, you've, you've done well. We can take on board the world's idea that to, to be a winner is what we all deserve. And that to dominate or have the last word is a place of being superior and success. And so it's very easy, I know for myself, to be conformed to the world's way of thinking in this area rather than God's way of thinking. And then I suddenly am reminded that his word says the first will be last, the last will be first. And then I try to rein in that competitiveness and try to, to submit it to, to God and his way of doing things because God's wisdom is higher than worldly wisdom and it turns everything in a sense upside down. Jesus tries to get the disciples to understand that to share in his glory is not this wonderful place that they have in their mind, but actually it's going to be the cup of suffering. We read carrying on from what was said in verse 41. When the 10 heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You see here that the other disciples, when hearing this, they were like cross. But, but before you think that they had better ideals, we look in the other Gospels and we find that all 12 of them at times argued about who was going to be the greatest. And so they really needed now to understand that this is not how it was going to be. Jesus, Jesus didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life up for each and every one of them and for each and every one of ours. Jesus explains what re leadership truly looks like in comparison to the earthly style of doing it. In kingdom community, status, money, um, charisma, those things are not marks of a leader, nor is the heavy hand of dominating. That's not leadership. It's the absolute opposite. It's servanthood and humility. I wonder this morning how we, what we can take away from this truth as we transition to become um, a new church, City Gates, it's very natural for us to wondering, who's going to do what? What role do I have to play? Who's going to lead? Who's going to follow? But I want to talk just for a moment about some of the core values we have. We're part of regions beyond family of churches around the world. And the incredible thing is that of their 11 core values, which if you want to look them up, you can find them on the Regions Beyond website, three of them speak into this. And I'm going to read them now. There for one another's success, enthusiastically servant-hearted, and humbly led by gifted leadership teams. These are our core values now. These are going to continue to be our core values. It's so refreshing when I read that first one, there for one another's success, because we live in a world where the norm is being there for my success, our success, not other people's success. I can honestly say for myself in this season of my life here, I've seen these core values outplayed in a way that I've not experienced before. In this family, it's part of our culture. It's part of our culture to celebrate when others do well, to rejoice when people have um, do well, whether it's in work, family life, or within church. We demonstrate that, we live that, it's our, our DNA. And I really want to see that continue, that we would have that DNA that puts other people before ourselves, that favors each other over ourselves. We want to be enthusiastically servant-hearted, asking, how can I help? How can I serve? 
And we need leadership teams that has led with humility in such a way that everyone within the team feels like we're doing this together. And so my encouragement would be that we continue to have this mindset of serving and having humility and lifting each other up because this is what Jesus demonstrated to us. The disciples, they made mistakes. We make mistakes. There were times where there was jealousy and there was um, competitiveness. There were rash words and actions. There was overstepping and overprotecting. But Jesus had them on a journey. He was discipling them. He was growing them. And when he ascended into heaven, he didn't leave them on their own, but he sent his Holy Spirit that came on each and every one of them in power. And those disciples went on to fulfill the calling that they had on their lives to be fishers of men. Each one of us here today has a call on our lives. Jesus has called us to follow him. He has a role for us to play in his church. He has work to do in our lives, but he doesn't leave us to do it in our own strength. We too have his Holy Spirit in us. And because of that, we can live in the way I've been looking at with you this morning from scripture, because greater is he that is in us. We can do all things through Jesus who gives us strength. I want to end now with um, a passage, a beautiful passage that Paul says, challenging the church in Philippi to be like Jesus, to have his mindset, to have his, their, our minds conform to his way and not the world. And as I read it, I really believe God's word changes us. As I read it, I would suggest maybe, maybe even close your eyes, just allow the word of God, not my words, but the word of God to wash over you and ask him to speak into your heart what he wants you to take away this morning. Philippians 2, 3 to 12. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality of God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. As I ask the worship team if they'd come up, I'd just like to finish with praying. Heavenly Father, we recognize that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that you are Lord to the glory of your Father. And Lord, this morning we want to do that now, not when you come, but now we want to recognize you are Lord of Lords, King of Kings. And I pray, Lord, that for each and every one of us, we would recognize our need to, to lay ourselves down in honor of you. We want to serve you. Help us, Lord, to deny ourselves. Help us, Lord, to follow you wholeheartedly. Lord, we want to be lifting others up and following in your example to your glory. By your spirit, I pray, Lord, fill us, use us, change us, refine us, mold us, Lord. We are yours. We are your clay and you are the potter. And we just give you all praise and glory. Amen. Amen.